I'm also very happy to be here, and uh, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm excited to learn from the other presenters about their efforts to solve this problem from a very different perspective than my own. I want to thank also Melissa and One Voice for bringing us here today to address this problem. I'm here to provide the perspective of an emergency room clinician and to describe how we have tried to intervene and minimize the problem. For the last eight years, I've been working as a nurse practitioner with Seacoast Emergency Physicians at Wentworth Douglas. And uh, in this setting, I have an intimate view of uh, the ravages of prescription drug abuse. Uh, and although I never expected to deal with it um, so frequently, not a day goes by where I don't uh, address this problem with at least one, but usually multiple patients per day. Um, I'm certain that Dr. Andrew did a great job showing us the statistics of the uh, the dramatic number of deaths per year, and I always, I always think that the scariest thing about that number is that it doesn't include any illegal drugs, and it doesn't include any of the people we successfully resuscitated. Um, uh, and, and I can also tell you that clearly, even though the deaths and overdoses are the dramatic presentation of this problem, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, my practice. Um, we find that the more prevalent presentation of a drug abuser is far more subtle and uh, can be one of the most frustrating and challenging parts of being a healthcare provider. Um, briefly, according to federal data, um, ED visits involving the use of non-medical uh, non use of pharmaceuticals increased from 2004 to 2009 nearly 100% to over 1.2 million visits um, in that year. All right, uh, Yes, 1.2 million visits. Uh, these numbers, again, do not include the multitude of visits by patients whose prescription drug problems are, are not detected at the time of the visit. Um, statistics also showed that in 2009, over 9% 9 of all people over age 12 uh, needed some form of treatment for substance abuse during that year. And uh, also, one in four US adults will struggle with some form of drug or alcohol problems in their lifetimes. So I think even those prevalence statistics alone, um, vigilance for abuse behavior really should be part of every patient encounter, not just the obvious ones. Um, in the ER, we, we, again, we, we, we must quickly assess and treat patients with all types of pain and illness. We have an ethical obligation to treat pain effectively, but we're also responsible for avoiding potentially dangerous medicines in people who are at risk for abuse problems. Um, and while it may be difficult, as Dr. O'Connell said, to differentiate between a person with legitimate pain and one who is feigning it, um, there are several things that can and should be done during the course of a patient encounter to minimize the chance that a drug will be prescribed inappropriately. Unfortunately, there are multiple reasons why this doesn't happen. Uh, the pressures of time, lack of access to a full medical history, uh, the obligation to address pain as a fifth vital sign, uh, the heavy weight assigned by organizations to good patient satisfaction scores are a few of the reasons why um, a provider may not uncover a prescription drug problem. Uh, while a provider may have suspicions, if he or she does not have the time or the tools or the training to eke out the truth, then the problem does not get addressed. Um, Shortly after I came to Wentworth Douglas, I volunteered to be a provider representative to a committee that um, dealt with frequent emergency room visitor, visit, uh, visitors and, and uh, especially difficult patients. Um, uh, we, we set out to try and develop multidisciplinary care plans for each individual patient that would refer to us. Um, and um, we soon realized that the majority of the referrals that came to us had something to do with uh, abuse behavior. Um, in due time, we had a pile of referrals and active care plans that numbered close to 700. And we didn't have any full-time staff to monitor these plans and go over them and make sure they were well done. And they really became untenable in number and really unreliable for us. So as a committee, we, we realized that we needed to turn the focus away from patient by patient to on our own behavior and find ways that we could better identify the problem and intervene. Um, and we needed to, uh, although, although it is never fun, we realize that we have to address the problem head on each visit at the time of the visit because any other way is just unreliable. Um, 
So, we are now working to change our culture in the emergency department to provide for patients what Dr. George Hansen in the medical literature refers to as a compassionate refusal. Our, our goal is to not only decrease the number of illegitimate prescriptions, but to also offer more referral to drug treatment um, when, pa when patients exhibit problem behavior. Our mission has really evolved to become more of an educational resource for staff um, to offer techniques for calmly and diplomatically dealing with these types of patients. Um, while some might say the ability to have difficult conversations with these patients um, is something innate to some and unattainable by others, I actually wholeheartedly disagree. Uh, I'm convinced that this approach can be reproduced by any provider who is faced with similar patients. And these skills, like so many that we acquire in our trainings, um, just need to be taught and practiced with more frequency. Um, putting this approach does require time and effort, but the payoff in better outcomes is certainly worthwhile. And in our department, a vigilant yet compassionate encounter begins prior to seeing the patient by reviewing all we can of their history. <coughs> Sometimes a record review or a, a list of diagnoses alone will reveal a prior substance-related problem, which then can segue into a discussion about um, potential recurrent problems. Um, excuse me. Um, in his book, uh, Responsible Opioid Prescribing, uh, Dr. Scott Fishman uses the term pharmacovigilance and cites the proverb, trust but verify. Um, phone calls to pharmacies are one way we verify patients um, reporting medicines. Uh, and although this step can be time consuming, it is often the most powerful tool we use to convince a patient that there's a problem with this drug behavior. Um, and to achieve a civil end to an encounter without prescribing an inappropriate med. Um, this step will certainly be far easier to do uh, if a prescription drug monitoring program is in place. Um, in the exam room, we strive to achieve a culture where empathy is the rule. Simple things like giving the patient time to tell their story sitting down are, are a long way, go a long way towards establishing relationships that are less likely to become adversarial when difficult conversations ensue. And it can be hard to be kind to a patient who is dishonest, but we've found that an empathetic approach is by far the most likely to result in a positive change. Uh, we consider dishonesty from a prescription drug abuser to be merely a symptom of their illness and not a personal affront. Uh, with this in mind, we have gotten better at suppressing our own normal human emotion of anger in the face of deception. Um, after finishing a history and exam to rule out other true medical emergencies um, or complications, we calmly and gently point out inconsistencies and counsel patients that this may signal a uh, drug abuse uh, health problem. Um, for example, if a patient has filled prescriptions that, do not tell, that they don't tell us about during their interview, or that indicate overuse, like filling a prescription for Vicodin two days ago, a large quantity that they, and then they denied recent prescriptions. Um, we simply inform the patient that based on this information, we are concerned and we cannot safely prescribe any other medicines for them. We also, other abusable medicines. Um, we also provide referrals to local drug treatment programs and encourage people to get further help when we uncover a problem. When done with concern and respect using factual information, we found that it's the rare instance when a patient escalates to a conflict and the encounter either ends positively or at the very least peacefully. Uh, we've also found it is important to take a good social history on patients. Um, in addition to standard questions, um, we ask patients if they've ever struggled with drugs or alcohol in um, their lives. Um, we find this empathetic phrasing may lead to increased reporting of previous problems. Uh, for patients who believe there's a stigma associated with drug and alcohol abuse. Um, we explain non-narcotic and non-pharmacologic techniques are often preferable in certain circumstances. And um, we educate patients about all patients about the risks of narcotics, even when we do prescribe them. Um, finally, to improve consistency amongst providers, um, we document our discussions well and we uh, attempt to use ICD-9 codes uh, like drug abuse and dependence when they're appropriate. Uh, our approach to dealing with the prescription drug problem in the ER is still evolving. In brief, when, it doesn't, when, in brief, when something doesn't seem right, we are attempting to speak to the elephant in the room. 
Uh, when done well, the patient understands uh, the rationale for our concern, and these encounters at least do not add to the problem of prescription drug use. Um, certainly, this approach alone is not adequate to solve the entire problem, but it's a good start. Unfortunately, we've had a number of successful encounters with patients that have led to extremely rewarding experiences for both our patients and ourselves. I'll finish with just a brief anecdote. Uh, a few years ago, I saw a patient uh, who was having low back, was complaining of low back pain. Our staff discovered that he was using a fraudulent name and had been seen in our ER many times over for sundry pain complaints. And the general feeling in the department was uh, initially one of some ill will towards this patient for dishonesty and criminal behavior. Um, at one point, risk management even became involved and um, they advised me to you know, ensure that the patient's medical complaint was addressed and that they would take care of the legal aspects of the case after the visit. And so I examined the patient and explained that he had strained his back and all he really needed was some ibuprofen and maybe a muscle relaxant. Um, and at this point, I think the patient really had a sense of the buzz in the department. He uh, even said, uh, I'm just going to go into my car for a second while we are getting his discharge papers. And I really felt like he was just going to cut his, cut his losses and leave. Um, but um, I felt that the patient's real, real emergency opiate addiction um, required more attention. So I, I asked the patient to come back into the exam room so I could talk to him some more. And my nurse colleague, Lois Day, and I um, didn't have, we really didn't have to do much more than sit down and say, listen, we're, we're really concerned about you. And uh, in this case, um, the guy just let it all out. He admitted to years of uh, prescription drug abuse, running around to other ERs, clinics. And uh, um, I expressed my concern that his life was only going to get worse, and perhaps even result in death. Um, so interesting information that the, the drug do doctor shoppers have more risk of overdose. So, so I was right on target with this guy. Um, so the patient, and we, we offered lots of detox resources, and we encouraged him, and he expressed his gratitude actually for our info, and assured us he was going to look into detox, and he left, and we felt pretty good about this patient's encounter, knowing the, but knowing the course of drug addiction, we also worried that our efforts would be all for naught. Um, but even so, we had changed the feel of the whole visit from one of dishonesty and feelings of anger toward the patient into one of compassion and positivity and hope. And, um, several months later, I ran into this patient at a playground in Dover with my kids. He was with his wife and child, and they had all that outward, outward appearance of being a happy and healthy family. Um, he approached me to thank me for having had a conversation with him, and was proud to report that he had eight months of sobriety under his belt. So I, I still get a little emotional, but I'm um, sorry. Um, I hope he's doing well. But I wanted to share this because I think we were truly rewarded for having had an effect on this guy. And while the effort we made for him is likely to fail for many others, like just like we can't save everyone from a heart attack, um, I think we will continue to strive to do this for similar patients every day. So in conclusion, I believe there's several changes we can make uh, to uh, minimize the detrimental effects of prescription drugs. Uh, we endorse the Governor's Commission's uh, call to action. We support the implementation of a real-time, user-friendly, and secure prescription monitoring program. We'd like to see more education about the problem in nursing and medical treat, uh, training programs. And uh, we look forward to collaborating with other sectors of healthcare, law enforcement, government, and education to uncover further solutions. So thanks for having me.